tells a, a lovely story that's fictional. And I want to get the privilege of telling you the, the most real, beautiful story that you've ever heard uh, from Matthew 2. It's only 11 verses. And uh, Rob tells a story about an amazing gift giver in a mom and a son. And I want to tell you about some wonderful gift givers called Magi that travel from the east uh, because they hear about this king that's born. And it says in Matthew 2 that they're going to approach this, this probably a two-year-old Jesus hanging out with his mom and dad in this, in this town. And it says in Matthew 2 verse 1, it says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. So these could be Babylonians, even from, from uh, descendants of the Magi that Daniel once oversaw. They might be uh, Arab kings. We don't know. But regardless, there's these wise men from the east that see a star that's significant enough to them that they say, we're willing to travel 700 miles west. A dangerous journey, something that we've never done before. Camelback, here we go. We're, we're taking off on this journey to follow this, this miraculous star that we know will lead us to a king. And so they take off and they, they arrive in Jerusalem and it says they asked, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and we have come to worship him. That's what Christmas is all about, right? Like we've come to worship him. So these men have no idea where they're going. They just by faith headed west. And so they show up in Jerusalem and as they're there, they stumble in and they say, look, we're here to worship the savior of the world. We have no idea where to go. Tell us where he is. It's unbelievable, right? We sing hark the herald angels sing. No one heralded him in. No person showed up to herald in this King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So God himself heralded him in. And so these, these men, no one heralded to them. They, they, they weren't told the truth by anyone, but they just saw a star, meaning that God heralded them to this place as well. That happens today. There's many people who they don't know anything about Jesus. They've never heard the name of Jesus yet through dreams or, or through some miraculous way that they come to know that there is a savior and it's like a star to them. And it happens all the time, all over this globe, all over this planet. And so these men are no different. These, this God drew them to himself. In fact, it says in Psalm 86, nine, it says this really beautiful truth that all the nations you have made. They're going to come and they're going to worship before you, O Lord, and they're going to glorify your name. So our God is the God of the nations. Our God is this, this King who's drawing all men, all women, you and me, even if today you feel like you're far from God, he's drawing you to himself because he says one day, every tribe, every nation is going to know the name of Jesus and no one can stop him. And so he lovingly draws you. In fact, the scripture says it's his kindness that draws you to himself. So verse three says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. He's in Jerusalem and he's very disturbing. He says, in fact, all Jerusalem is disturbed with him. In fact, the original language that that word all represents, it means it means all the Jewish and Roman leaders. So all those in authority and they're really concerned because they think, what's this Messiah going to mean for us? Is he going to bring war? Is he going to make us steer away from our lustful desires? Like, what's this, this Savior going to mean? All we want is the authority of Herod. And of course, Herod feels the same way. So he pulled together some people in verse 4. And I want you to see this. He says, it says, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So these, these teachers and these, these leaders within the, the scriptures, they know the word so well. They say, oh, you're talking about Micah 5 too. Where, where Jesus or the Savior is going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. And this blows my mind, everybody. I just don't understand this, that these chief priests and the teachers of the law, like they know what's up with the scriptures. They know so much about what God's word means, but they didn't pack up and go to Bethlehem. So King Herod, he's like, hey, what does this mean? Where's this baby going to be born? And they say, oh, you're talking about Micah 5. Yeah. So, so it's gonna, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, Judea. That, that's what's going to happen. But they don't, they don't take off. They're experts on the Messiah. 
Yet it's like they don't care enough about the Messiah to, to go. They know the promise, but they don't do anything with it. And so when Herod, Herod asks them, they know everything about what he's talking about, but they don't act on it. And, and when I was studying that, I, it's like I, I felt my heart just kind of looking up and I thought, what happened to them? In this real moment, in real history, what, what happened to these people who knew so much about God? How can they be so trained in the Word? How can they know so much about the Bible and about God, but not do anything with it? It doesn't move them. It doesn't stir their hearts. Like, why would that be? And, and I think the lesson for us is simple today. That maybe you know nothing about Jesus. Maybe you feel like you know a ton about the Word. But I would just say, don't be too casual about anything that's divine. Don't be too casual with that. Don't, don't be indifferent about the Bible and about the truth of the Scripture because these experts of the law, they know everything, but they're unmoved. They know so much about the Messiah, yet they're, they're not stirred and they just plant right where they are and they go back to just studying the Bible. They go back to just reading all that. So this is an ongoing problem, right, with the Pharisees and the chief priests and the teachers in the first century. In fact, in John 5, Jesus himself, as an adult, he said, you study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So it's like me reading a book about how to date my wife. And I'm reading the book while I'm on the date with my wife. And as I'm reading it, in the book it tells me, do not read while you're on a date with your wife, right? That's what these experts are doing. It's my, my wife is telling me, Tommy, can you not read? I, hey, I'm learning how to date you right now. Can you chill and let's let me learn how to date you? They're experts on who he is, yet they refuse to come to him. So I would just tell you today, knowing about Jesus is so different than knowing Jesus. It's different. And so the obvious truth of Matthew 2 kind of shows up in this part where you can know all about the Bible and you can totally miss Jesus. So look how it concludes here, verse 7. It says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. He's making that up. He has no intentions of worshiping. Verse 9, After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star... This is what draws us together, everybody. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So here's something you need to know today, that him as a, as a baby, even as an adult, when Jesus had his earthly ministry, there was nothing special about his appearance. That's what was told us all through scripture and even the prophets would say, there's not gonna be anything special. So when these, these men show up to see this savior, this king, the one who's gonna rule and reign in eternity, the one who has is, who is breathed them to be, when they see him in flesh and blood, when they show up, he looks nothing like a king. Even as an adult, as the, the Messiah grew and taught and did miracles, there was nothing special about his appearance. So they show up to the house and they see a two-year-old Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I see two-year-olds, I love them, but nothing compels me to worship them, right? And they show up and they see this two-year-old Jesus and they realize through faith that this is their king. And so they bow right where they are and they worship him. They just fall on their faces and they worship him and they, they present the best gift ever given to humanity. They present him with gifts. It's gift after gift after gift. And it's, it's not that their gifts are, are earning something for them. Their gifts are given to this king by faith. And I'll just tell you today, that's exactly the way it is. That this true story from the scriptures, nothing else mattered to these men. Nothing else mattered. Jesus was just enough. Everything else just kind of faded away. Every other valuable thing to them, it didn't, it didn't compare. Everything else just submitted to this, this king. He was enough. Jesus was enough. He's the greatest gift ever offered to you. And so this Christmas season, what, what pulls us together is that we've come to worship the, the greatest gift ever given to us. 
that it is not a fictional story. It is the reality of, of the truth of life that it is given to you from our God and that you had this fractured relationship with the Lord. Yet he sent his son Jesus to be born in a manger but that manger ties to a cross every time because if they don't tie together, then one of them doesn't matter. And so this manger ties to a cross that some years later, Jesus would give his life for you and for me, for our sins, because we had this broken, fractured relationship with God and that he came to make things right for us. And that is symbolized through the, the birth of a baby who came in humility, did not come looking like a ferocious king. He came as a humble, vulnerable baby who would grow in to the man who would give his life, fully God, fully man, give his life for you and me on a cross so that we can have a restored relationship with God himself. That he is Emmanuel, God with us. And for that, we've come to worship. He made a promise to you years and years ago that I'm gonna make a way for you. Despite your sin, despite your pain, your shame, all that, I'm gonna make a way for you to have a beautiful relationship with me. One of freedom, one of purpose, and one of fulfillment. And that begins with my son who's delivered in a manger. And so that's why we come to worship today. The light of the world was born. And because of him, we get to have new life. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for the truth of Matthew 2. It's, it's overwhelming, God, to think that, that you came for us on a rescue mission for us, Lord, to redeem humanity, to help humanity when we could not help ourselves, to forgive us, God, when, when there was no hope, there's no light, it's only darkness, but God, you, you yourself are light. And you came in flesh and blood to not only show us how to live out our day-to-day -day lives, but to redeem us and to show us that we have this great redeemer, this great healer, this great savior in Emmanuel, God with us. So Father, thank you for the truth of the gospel. I pray if someone is in this room or watching online, God, and they don't know you, that they would realize that they can come to know you even now. Just praying to you, just talking to you the way I am, God. They can just ask you, Father, to forgive them of their sins and to help them follow you, to submit to the truth of the gospel that Jesus came for them, died for them, rose again for them. And it's because of that that they can have joy today. They can live in the fullness of life. Because when you give life, you give it abundantly, God. So we thank you for that. And I pray for those that are far from you, Lord, that they would uh, repent of their sins even now and they would draw close to you in this moment. Father, thank you for being the light of the world. You're the hope of this planet. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray over all these things. Amen. Amen.